We have the real privilege today of having Dr. Peter Rice from Scotland, who, um, um, yeah, I, I, you, I think you'll find incredibly stimulating in terms of not only um, his clinical um, life, his 25 years as an addiction psychiatrist, but also in the role that he's played in Scotland in terms of alcohol um, reform. Um, and also in, in rolling out screening and brief intervention. So we're really in for a treat. And I just I want to um, invite Lucy Clark, who you will all know, to just come up and just set the scene for why NZMA, the Royal New Zealand College of General Practice Practitioners and the New Zealand College of Public Health Medicine decided that it would be a really great thing to host this event. So, and, and, and I do appreciate you don't all know me, but <laughs> hopefully you will soon. Um, I'm Leslie Clark, I'm the Chief Executive from the, of the NZMA. I just want to take a couple of minutes, um, first of all, to thank the Health Promotion Agency and Sue uh, for the idea of bringing us together. The NZMA, the College of GPs and College of Public Health were thrilled uh, to, to participate and really good to see a good group, group of people here today. And I know, do know how hard it is to get to these things during the working day, so thank you for coming along. Um, this is an important issue for us, for the NZMA, for the medical profession, and really for, for the whole of the health sector. I mean, certainly we as an organisation, we've had 128 years of history in New Zealand, originally part of the uh, British Medical Association, that lasted until the 1960s, would you believe it? Um, we, we've always been concerned about the harm um, that alcohol can involve. Um, and looking at ways to mitigate that harm through a variety of mechanisms. Um, certainly we were very pleased in 2009 when the Law Commission made some really good recommendations um, that should have you know, sort of applied in their fullness, mm -hmm. um, mitigate and reduce the, the effect of alcohol on individuals, their families and the community. Um, we support those recommendations. We called for, and I need to read my notes, just make sure I don't miss anything terribly important, for increased taxes, minimum pricing, stronger regulation of alcohol marketing, um, an increase in the minimum purchase age, and a reduction in the VAC level for drivers. Um, since then, we've also actively participated in the establishment of local um, alcohol policies. So, um, mm. as you know, local bodies are are doing this in a variety of ways, some perhaps more successfully than others. Um, and we've been submitting to that process at a national level, but also trying to mobilise our members, uh, doctors in the community, to actually um, submit and be part of that process uh, at, at the local level. Um, and specifically around reducing trading hours and um, looking at curbs on, on the alcohol industry. <clears throat> So while we've been working sort of at a central and local government area, we also reflect on the fact that health professionals also have a critical role to play. And I think this is one of the key things we're hoping to learn from, from Peter today, and thank you for, for taking the time to address us. Um, you know, we're very committed to raising the level of professional awareness, um, and we applaud the work that um, our guest, Dr Peter Rice, has done, both in, in raising awareness of the harm linked to health, alcohol use, use and championing um, evidence-based measures to reduce that harm. So I think it's going to be a hugely um, informative um, session today, a lot of good things that we'll be able to take back, um, both at sort of, you know, where we need to be working at an advocacy and policy level, but also potentially where we can be working at a practice mm -hmm. and clinical level as well. So thank you, and I won't take up any yeah. more time. Thank you, thank you Peter. Right. Um, yeah, th thanks very much, Leslie, and, 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 and that's exactly, you know, that, that multi, multi-level way of thinking and conceptualising both alcohol harm and, and the responses to that is precisely my, 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 my title. Um, it was a real pleasure to be here. I was, I was over here in 2009 and, and uh, well, the Law Commission were, were producing their, their report and uh, made a little bit of a contribution to that. And, uh, this is absolutely right. You're not going to get a better report than, than, than that, well laid out, good historical overview, recommendations that really kind of fitted in with, with, with international best practice, but and the challenge for that really is in, is in the implementation, which is a, a small word but a, a, big, a big task. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll say a little bit about um, 
why I think in Scotland we've been able to make a bit of progress on, on this and, and, uh, uh, and that uh, may help you to understand some of the barriers that you've faced. Um, but it is a real pleasure to be in New Zealand. It feels kind of very much like, like home. I mean, the first Scots who, who landed here, um, I was going to say they must have been really surprised to see a country that looked so much like theirs, but then realised that they probably if you'd only ever seen Scotland and New Zealand, you would think the whole world was kind of green and hilly and you know, full of sheep. <laughs> But uh, it does feel like, uh, you know, familiar being here, and, and uh, no doubt there are some Scots or people very close to being Scots in the in the audience um, today. And and of course, there's been so much in, in, in your news about the, 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 the UK. It kind of feels it never left. Of course, with our referendum coming up on on, on Thursday, and and other things like uh, the, the the announcement of the royal baby and some wag. Uh, link these two things um, <laughs> to the polls narrow and two days later the royal baby gets announced um, so but we'll see what happens we'll, we'll actually be down in Dunedin at the cutting edge conference when the Scottish referendum results <laughs> come through so that will be an interesting afternoon um, okay I'm you know I worked as I said for 25 years as an addiction psychiatrist very rewarding job you see a lot of very sick ill people get very much better in the prime of their lives and that's one of the things I, I really liked about, about that job. But um, I think it's it's um, a job where it's clear that you know, no matter how efficient you are, you know, pulling people out the river, stopping them falling in, in the first place is going to be a much more productive uh, activity to do. So my own kind of interest you know, shifted you know, increasingly towards towards policy stuff. And this is what Scottish Health Action and Alcohol Problems is. Um, it's an advocacy, advocacy group that was set up in 2006, uh, comprising you know, that bunch of, of, of Royal Colleges, including the Royal College of Nursing, so GPs, psychiatrists, physicians, and, 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 and you'll, you'll see them all listed up there. And that's you know, similar to the, to the coalition that's, that's, that's in this room. Um, and so that's what Scottish Health Action and Alcohol Problems is. We've got one and a half funded staff, so, but, but a lot of volunteer time that goes into that, including the likes of me. So, uh, and we work very closely with the British Medical Association and with Alcohol Focus Scotland, who is our big charity. So that's really been the three coalitions. It's been the Medical Advocacy Specialist Alcohol Group, the profession, medical profession were generally represented by in our case, the British Medical Association, and the, the alcohol kind of charity thing covering you know, activity more, more generally, um, the, the Alcohol Focus Scotland. So that's really uh, we, we've been, and we've, I think, ended up working closely with the government, uh, really because they have moved to close to our position, uh, and I'll say a bit more about that later. Um, why did we get going in 2006? And the answer really lies in this graph. Um, this is a pretty narrow definition of alcohol-related deaths dominated by cirrhosis deaths. And you, know, you don't need to be an epidemiological genius to see what's happening here. This really steep climb in, in, in um, alcohol-related deaths, really starting from the, the, the mid-1990s. Um, and I think an important message from Scotland has been the importance of good data. Mm -hmm. uh, we, I think, have had a very good team of public health scientists and epidemiologists based in Health Scotland, which is our NHS health promotion agency. Uh, and they, this is just simply making use of the data that had been lying around for ages that nobody had looked at very much of you know, what was on death certificates. So it gives you a really effective trend measure once you've got an indicator, stick with it, don't change it, because even though it might be wrong year to year, it will give you good trend indication. And this enabled us to really say that, although Scots might like to think we'd always had this kind of particular relationship with alcohol and style of drinking, in fact that wasn't true. Things were changing and things were getting very much worse. Um, and I'm pleased to say that things have got better. Um, it would be nice to say SHAP was founded in 2006 and look at that, you know, 20% fallen deaths. Um, I think the economic recession has had more to do with that than anything we've done, but I'll, I'll come back to that point uh, 
later on. But we have been in a situation where the, you know, the deaths have been, have been declining. But in terms of kind of getting the message out to the rest of the profession, to politicians and to general public, this message that things change is really important. So in Scotland, the phrase might be, it's I've been like this, you know, this is just what we're like. And that's not true. So things change really quite considerably with alcohol-related harm. So if the Scottish psyche didn't transform in the 10 years from 1994 to 2004, the weather's changing a wee bit, but it didn't you know, transform over those 10 years. So people say, well, that's just what Scots are like. It's because of the bad weather, blah, 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 blah. You know, you need to debunk all of this and say there are actually you know, there are things happening here that, we, that, that we, we can put our finger on. I'll talk later about what those things are. Um, this, I think, was, was the other kind of totemic slide in the, in the thing, in, in, in really the campaign. And again, cirrhosis mortality rates back to the 50s, men on the left as you're looking at it, and women on the right. And it showed the same kind of change and showed that what was happening in Scotland was not part of an inevitable international set of trends. So now there's a kind of lad at medical school in Glasgow in the early 80s, the story was that Scots would fight and trauma and injuries and marriages would break up and all that kind of stuff, but at least we didn't get cirrhosis like the French did. And um, <laughs> over the 1980s that transformed. You'll see that the other European countries <coughs> where cirrhosis deaths would have been dominated by France and Spain, uh, Portugal to a lesser extent Italy. Considerable falls in these countries over cirrhosis deaths since the, since the 70s. And they did some things about that. France is not relaxed about alcohol. There's no TV advertising with alcohol in France. Sports team will never take the field with an alcohol logo. Um, any, when the Scottish rugby team is sponsored by Famous Grouse Whiskey, they mm -hmm. had to change that logo when they he played at the Parc de France in, 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 in Paris when occasionally Celtic progressed far into the depths of European champions and played Paris Saint-Germain if they're sponsored by a cider company as they are just now they need to take over that when they take the field. So France has taken significant measures to, uh, to, to reduce alcohol harm. At the time we were doing opposite things in ours cloud. So again the message that not just that things are changing in Scotland but they're changing in a way that isn't international different countries are changing quite different ways, was an important message to, to, to get over. What were the demographics of what was happening in, in these, uh, uh, there's a pretty simple message from these complex looking, looking slides. Uh, again, uh, men, men up here, women up here. Um, this is 55 to 64 age groups for hospital admissions. This is uh, 45 to, 50 to 54 year olds. This is the kind of mid 30s. This is the over 65s. So the claims that we were seeing were not amongst young people. I mean, clearly young people have a, have a kind of pretty low rate of possible admission anyway. But the under 20s were not showing the same kind of claim. So the kind of comfortable position that, oh well, it's all these young people, in fact, was not reflecting the reality. Some of our most worrying trends were amongst the older age groups. This is men over the age of 65 years, increasing rate of alcohol-related hospital admission. We could have had headlines every day about intoxicated young women in this posed picture, actually, which was a, from a photograph agency. It came to be called Bench Girl, with a girl in a short skirt lying on a, on, on a bench with bottles underneath her. That was, would have been quite a comfortable kind of image to, to have promoted, to characterise the problem, but it would have been misleading because this was not just a young person's problem. So we made this deliberate decision not to go for the easy headlines on women and young people. And uh, you know, this mantra of middle-aged men matter too became important. Uh, there was uh, an event I was at <coughs> really towards the start of the campaign where you know, we were just talking about rates of alcohol harm and somebody stood up and made the point about women's drinking and isn't it terrible. And somebody else stood up and made the point about, uh, about, about young people's drinking and big worries about that. And, Somebody else then stood up and talked about these Europeans that moved into Scotland. And then the next guy stood up and said, it's lucky that adult Scottish men don't drink heavily or we'd really be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and his point was that in the interest of these kind of subgroups, people were actually referring to the great big massive harm that happened amongst you know, 
middle-aged men, and I guess nobody expected anything better of them, so they didn't kind of comment. It. But but that was that whole population approach was a very important bit of the of the, the health advocacy campaign. And the other bit of that was that as other things were getting better, alcohol trends were getting worse. And this is a, a slide from my colleague Nick, Nick Sheridan in, in University of Southampton, uh, showing that for the other kind of big killers in the UK, diabetes deaths, cancer deaths, you can see all their heart disease, stroke disease death. Actually, the news was pretty good on all of them. But if you look at liver disease deaths, they were you know climbing hugely. So if you are the chief medical officer for Scotland or England or Ireland or Wales, alcohol is becoming a bigger and bigger chunk of what you should be worried about because as other things are getting better, all this is getting worse. And so as a contribution to our kind of national burden of, of illness and harm, alcohol was becoming uh, more and more important. Um, so and my, the last one of my mantra of things change is this is UK alcohol consumption across the 20th century. Massive swings in consumption. We've never got back to the 11 litres of pure alcohol per head that we had in 1900. A spectacular fall at the start of the 20th century. Um, related partly to the war, but actually starting even before then. This kind of period in the 1950s where the British Medical Journal, um, there was a, a leading article published, you know, we have defeated alcoholism in the UK, hooray. You know, we had a terrible problem in previous generations, and now it's pretty much gone away. And if you're in Italy now, this is what you would think. Italians <coughs> drink half of what their parents drank, huge declines in alcohol harm. So you do see these really big generation to generation changes and swings. And you can see the upswing <coughs> that we've had in the, in the UK really since the, the, the 50s and, and up into the 80s. And again, this recorded will fall. So, our rates of alcohol harm track very closely to our consumption patterns. You might say, well, how come liver disease, which you know, takes you 15 years of heavy drinking to get, how, how, how come liver disease rates fall so, so quickly? And the reason for that is whether you're not, you die of, I'm hoping there's no hepatologist in the audience, if they are, they might shoot me down, but I think I'm right about this. Whether or not you die of liver disease depends on your drinking in the last year. So you might have been pretty close to the, the edge. You may not even have known that you had cirrhosis, as you, as, you, as you know, may not present until pretty late. Uh, but if people cut back to <coughs> drinking, they move back from that cliff edge, and, and the, 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 the mortality rates really fall within two or three years of, of a declining uh, alcohol uh, harm. So it doesn't actually take the same length of time for the disease to, 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 to develop uh, as it does for, the, for rates to fall. So in fact, we see falls really pretty quickly. And so the Scottish trends have been really quite uh, pure, if you like, in the relationship between consumption and measures of harm, be that mortality or hospital admission data. If we had better social harm data, that'd be terrific. But trying to measure, you know, the child protection impact of alcohol is you just don't have the same kind of data. But we do for health, so we use health data, I think, reasonably as the proxy for, you know, all kinds of other harm. That early part of the century is interesting. This is Glasgow Green. Any Glaswegians here, apart from me? No. Okay. This is Glasgow Green looking over to, to the Gorbals. I'm speaking to Andrew Hearn, then his colleague who's, who was born in the Gorbals, the other side of the river plant here. But this is a mass movement taking a pledge. This was the British temperance movement uh, in the 1900s, which was a social improvement movement. It wasn't particularly a religious movement in the UK. So the people who wanted temperance, uh, also wanted schools, hospitals, clean water, good housing and all, all of that. So that was, you know, that's the temperance movement thing often gets uh, misportrayed uh, as, as being a, you know, rabid uh, religious organisation. It wasn't that way in the UK. And in fact, the roots of the British Labour Party lay in the temperance movement. I think they kind of forgotten about. But um, so, at the start of that big fall, in, you know, that process of big fall in consumption in the early part of the 20th century, this is what was going on. Um, uh, and and uh, so, important not to forget that. Anyway, why were we seeing the, the climbs that we saw in alcohol harm in Scotland? And we now really have a pretty good idea 
of what affects levels of alcohol harm in, in communities. And this is the second edition of the WHO sponsored publication, of which your own Sally Caswell is one of the authors, I think she's somewhere on that list. Um, and, and the title of this is really important Alcohol, No Ordinary Commodity. So it's not an ordinary commodity like milk or bread or buckets or <coughs> whatever else you know, might be sold in a shop. Um, so, and they, this is the second edition of their review of what affects rates of alcohol harm. And this is the list. Very similar to the list that your Law Commission came up with, very similar to the list that Alcohol Action New Zealand have for their five plus point plan. Uh, I heard Alcohol Health Watch New Zealand's wish list, and again, it's the same kind of stuff. So, at the top, for the most effective measures, price controls, um, treatment interventions actually rate somewhat surprisingly highly, and I'll come on to that later. Uh, these kind of availability measures, age limits, hours, and so on, come in here. Um, and down at the bottom is education and information, so classroom campaigns and so on, have a effect. Now, the problem for this, if you're a politician, is the easy things are down here and the really hard things are up there. And, you know, that, I think, you know, in a many, many places governs, you know, really what, what, what happens. In the UK, over the 80s, we were seeing big changes in price. There was really no growth in treatment. And actually, probably during the 80s and 90s, access to alcohol treatment got tighter in the UK. And I, I think the reason for that is our addiction services were so focused on injectable opiates and methadone programs that that pretty much took over. <coughs> that took over of you know m most of the capacity and, and alcohol kind of isn't wasn't such a front page story as heroin uh, and you know, so sort of treatment facilities probably declined uh, unavailability hours got, got got longer the number of outlets increased and so on and so forth so pretty much all of our indicators were pointing in the in the wrong direction in the in the 80s and 90s and of course, at the top of that list is, is price. And this is what happened to the price, the affordability of alcohol in the UK. So this is alcohol getting cheaper as the, as the line goes up. Uh, and what you'll see here was that there were the fall in the relative cost of alcohol relative to income was not uniform. So down here, we have pubs, beer, and wine, and spirits in pubs, and not a lot of change, uh, but a very marked fall in the off-trade sector. And one of the nice things about New Zealand is when you say the off-trade, people know what you mean. When you say the off-trade in France, they look at you blankly. So uh, it's nice that you get the same terminology as us. So stores and supermarkets, marked falls in the in the relative cost of alcohol, cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And actually, in pubs and restaurants where you know, much of the cost of what people pay across the counter isn't, isn't the alcoholic product, it's wages, it's, it's you know, property costs and so on and so forth. Not much of a change. So we saw this marked change in affordability, particularly driven by stores and supermarkets. Um, so in the mid-90s, it was pretty much half and half between the pub and the supermarket. Uh, less than 20 years later, we'd seen a big shift to you know, about 70-30 supermarket sales to pubs. I think in New Zealand, you're about 80-20. Mm -hmm. um, so but there's been a big demise of the great British pub. Pubs are closing hand over fist in the, in the UK as people shift towards drinking at home. And in terms of what we were seeing in the clinic, uh, this is from a study that uh, Grant and Chick and Jan Gill and colleagues did in Edinburgh. 88% of their clinic attenders, and this was a hepatology clinic and an alcohol treatment clinic, big you know, weighting <coughs> towards uh, home drinking from the clinic. And if you look to the heaviest drinkers in that population, so this is 25% of heaviest drinkers, this is people drinking a bottle of vodka a day. So 30 of, of our units a, a day, so that's the equivalent of a bottle of spirits. Uh, tiny amounts of pub drinking going on there, completely dominated by uh, drinking at home. Now, 
what are the kind of effects of this shift? One is, I don't want to kind of unduly romanticise the pub, but pubs are a kind of social environment, and there are other people there, there are kind of codes of conduct, and there actually are people who might lose their jobs if things get out of hand in the pub, um, and so they've got an interest in the pub, you know, staying a, a, an orderly kind of place. Um, and so these people who serve this alcohol have some responsibility about what then happens with it. These checkout operators wafting the stuff through the checkout, and I, I should tell you that in, 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 Scot in Scotland and throughout the UK, spirits are sold in supermarkets as well as wine and beer. So these folk wafting the bottles of vodka or bottles of wine over the barcode scanner and giving it to the consumer have absolutely no idea what's happening when that thing goes home. They have no responsibility for doing that. And there's no, I can't think of any mechanism to make sure that they would have a responsibility for what happens. So the whole kind of drinking environment is shifting in a, in, a neg in a way that reduces both formal and informal controls on intoxication. Uh, and uh, so that's been a kind of negative shift. And it's really become one of the things that we've latterly decided to go quite public about, which is that pubs are a good thing. And actually shifting this back would, would be a good thing. And actually we've made common cause with the pubs in that. that Quite surprised you'd be happy to, to get into discussion about that. So this kind of drift of, of, of consumption um, has, has, uh, has been a big issue. And as I say, in Scotland we <coughs> we don't have liquor stores. I mean, you've got liquor stores, you've got plenty of them. It's really quite striking how many you can drive past. Um, but we don't have them because our supermarkets really have that market. About 80% of all off-street alcohol is sold by supermarkets now. Uh, and uh, so they have become very, very powerful in the market. They set the price, they dictate the price to the producers. If you're a beer producer, you have to do what Tesco tells you, or you know, history. Uh, so they've become really very, very important. And they know a lot about our consumption patterns. Uh, and uh, one of my, my pals sent, sent me this just to show me how much supermarkets understand about consumer behaviour. Um, uh, ordering online, so this product Horlicks is unavailable, why not try 12 cans of cider instead? So that was, that was the option with uh, the online shopping uh, 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 site through up to you. Trying to get to sleep, they're sold out of Horlicks but they'll sell you cider instead. Uh, there's an important point in here that the retailers have enormous amounts of information now on consumer behaviour which they don't share. Yeah. In, the, in, the, in the public interest. And when you look at the countries that have state monopolies, like Sweden and indeed many states in the USA will have this, and Canada, they know a lot more about drinking patterns and information that, that we do. And my, my own view is that it should be an obligation of, a, of the privilege to hold a license that you should share your data. Uh, anyway, that's, that's uh, a, a bit of a, a kind of side issue. Okay, so we decided that we really needed to focus on the cheapest end of the market and a kind of campaign started rolling. Um, so this BBC Scotland news story, this is the Scottish Government Justice Secretary Kerry McCaskill who had been in office for a month when he announced this. So this was the first time his party had ever been in power. Um, he'd been speaking to us a lot the, the, beforehand. He said... He wanted to make alcohol one of the big things if, the, if he was the policy lead for the party in, in, in the 2007 election. Um, and you know, he's pretty much as, as, as good to, to, to his word. And so you'll see the script there, alcohol was no different than buying soap powder or bananas. So that was using the new ordinary commodity kind of language. Um, perverse that a bottle of cider can cost less than a bottle of water. So that's the government. Later the, the, the same month we got some data on alcoholic liver disease, so the Conservative Party who are one of the opposition parties, um, Baby Scanlon, who's been a bit of an ally, not all the time, but most of the time on this, uh, she kind of did, did, did her bit too. Um, the BNA then kind of weighed in later, later this month, and much of this was kind of planned and coordinated, that different organisations would, would be saying different things. Um, and this was, as you see, the, the BNA thing. So 
that um, was, was really quite an important phase of just making it clear the extent of public interest and public concern about this. So in other words, in all, you know, for those of you who are addiction psychiatrists, motivational interviewing terms, if patients are going to change, they do that because they're worried. They need to be worried before they do anything else. And this was the phase of, of, of problem recognition, that sort of kind of work you do in a clinical setting of building concern in the patient before they make any behaviour change. This was the, the, the phase of, of problem recognition. Um, and then they, they came up with uh, a plan for a minimum price, uh, which is based on a report that, that we had produced um, before. So, so and, and our interest in minimum price really was to focus on the cheapest alcohol. Um, that's why we went for that rather than across the board price increases. So, why is the cheapest alcohol particularly important here? And this is a bit of a kind of complicated econometric study, but I've kind of tried to boil it down into one slide. What this group from Berkeley, California, from, from Sweden did was look at the Sweden state monopoly sales data. So that's one of the big advantages they had. And they looked at the same overall price increase in the, in the total alcohol spend for the country, but approaching that price increase in, th in three different ways. So the best way to explain it is if you think of two bottles of wine in New Zealand, one at $30 and one at $7. If you do something that affects all drinks equally, which an excise duty would achieve, so your $30 bottle of wine goes up a dollar and so does your $7 bottle of wine, that, that achieves a, this kind of level of, 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 of reduction. Don't take the 31 and 8 as gospel, I'm just using that to indicate the type of increases we're talking about. So you get a 2% decrease in consumption. If you focus all of your overall price increase on the cheapest end, so the $7 wine goes up to say $10, and you get more than twice the effect. Okay, why do you get more than twice the effect? You won't twice the take the thing we're, that we're very used to hearing in our, in our clinic, which is of substitution and trading down. As people drink more heavily, if we take a drinking history from them, they might start off at the start of their drinking career drinking, you know, drinks that will impress their friends or the opposite or same sex in a, in a pub and drinking, you know, flash drinks that will, you know, carry a bit of social cachet and be, be cool to be seen drinking. As the drinking gets heavier, they say, I've got, uh, I'm not going to pay that anymore. I'll, I'll drink at home rather than go out to the pub. I get more, you know, I can have five beers for the price of the pay for two. Uh, and so they trade down as the drinking then gets very heavy. They'll, they'll end up drinking whatever's cheapest. So mm -hmm. whether that's cask wine here, for instance, I believe. In our case, it would be cider or cheap vodka. So that process of substitution that you see in the heaviest drinkers, um, the, the for the ones who are getting into most problem, the cheapest alcohol, the floor price of the cheapest stuff, becomes really important because that's where they end up. And if you do something that affects the price of that cheapest stuff, the rock bottom, if you like, is a little bit higher than it would be otherwise. So the floor price of alcohol is particularly important because of that trading down and substitution thing. So if you want to understand minimum pricing, you really need to say, just think of that, of that trend. I, I, I once gave that example in a meeting where I talked about you know starting off drinking a flash drink in a, in a cocktail bar and then you know moving on to drinking you know cans of beer at home and then rooting around looking for the cooking sherry and somebody said you just described my typical night out so, <laughs> so the substitution thing is, is is important and the thing that really kind of put the lid on me for, for this, this this study was if you actually focus your price changes on the top of the market. So this would be GST, I think, is your, your sales tax equivalent. So the expensive wine goes up to $33 on your $7 uh, bottle wine goes up by $0.70. Cents. The modelling from Sweden shows that consumption increases. So why does consumption increase? It increases because your $30 a wine drinker says, I'm not going to pay $33 for wine, I'm going to buy... $15 bottle of wine, and they think, actually this tastes alright, I think I'll buy two. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, in fact, the, the top end of the market 
causes people to kind of shift down a bit. So I don't want to make too much of, 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 of this as saying this is just a, a kind of modelling study, but I, I think it does reinforce the message that it's the cheapest stuff that matters, and the mid-range and upper-range stuff is, is, is not so important. So that's why minimum price uh, matters to us. Um, the opposition parties moved to block it, probably for political reasons, first time. They, they thought this is a new party in power. The public will think this is a crazy idea. We'll, we'll just vote it out and say this is a bunch of eccentrics. You know, you need to get the, get, get the usual parties back in and sanity will be restored. So it was defeated. But the SNP <coughs> had minimum unit pricing high in their manifesto for the, for the 2011 election. They won that election. Uh, actually got a majority in Parliament, which was unexpected the way our voting, our voting system structured. Um, and the measure was passed actually with Conservative Lib Dem support. Labour ended up abstaining because they were in a huff about it. Uh, but in fact, the, the measure was passed uh, without opposition. And so I think we can kind of safely say that uh, you know there's real political consensus for, for the measure. So passed in May 2012, due to be introduced in April of last year. But it's not been introduced um, for, for various reasons, which I'll come on to. Sorry, I forgot my previous slide in here. But I think just very quickly to kind of recap, in the early stages of minimum price, it was produced by a medical organisation. It came from us as an idea. It was picked up by the politicians, it was supported by the police and charities, and much of the alcohol industry wanted to see minimum unit price come in. The pubs, for the reasons I've talked about, and the small brewers were also wanted to see it. And the opposition came from the global producers and the large retailers. So the big guys opposed regulation, the small guys supported it. And the big guys, represented by the Scotch Whiskey Association, have challenged the law now in a series of courts. They lost in the Scottish courts. Um, there's now been a, they uh, have appealed to the European Court of Justice, and that finally will come out at the beginning of next year, and they're very involved with, with, um, with that. So, that's the, so we're in the midst of a kind of legal battle to, to get this measure to come in. Uh, and some of that was written up in the BMG at the start of this year. Uh, when the government in Westminster, who have responsibility for the Wales, dropped minimum unit price, uh, or rather shelved it, that they come back. Um, I have to say, though, we, we've not had the, the coolant of dirty politics in, in, in our country on this. And, and some of the stuff that's happened here, and has happened to Doug Selman, has been way in excess of anything any of us have had to face in the UK. So you've got a funny situation here, and uh, you know, I think you, I would urge you to show solidarity with your with your colleagues on, on, on this because you see you've had a odd set of, of circumstances and pressures that I think as I say way the, uh, above and beyond anything any of us have been exposed to. So our government's pressing ahead with with alcohol in, in Scotland. The Welsh government want to do it as well. So do Northern Ireland and so much hinges on the uh, on the outcome of the um, of the of the of the court case, um, and I like quoting this this leader from the Times, who are not normally a kind of public health friendly anti business newspaper, but really saying that they think the Scotch Whisky Association have got this wrong, that they might win the legal case, but there'll be a very substantial reputational damage to them, um, and that's actually probably one of our jobs. The example from Australian plain packaging is the in tobacco industry can probably keep going with legal action forever more if they want to by suing in different countries and so on and so forth. And we need to just try to get to a position where the opponents decide it's just you know, too, too harmful for them to keep fighting the, 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 the legal case. So that's where we're at with minimum unit pricing. Um, I'll maybe take a little break there and see if people want to ask questions before I then move on to talk about, about screening and, and brief intervention. So that's really the, a trip through our, our you know, medical advocacy campaign. And, and I think many people in New Zealand and indeed some people in this room will have been through exactly the same kind of process. The politics have been different and that makes a difference to the outcome. And I'm well aware we've had a bit of an easy ride. But, uh, and just being any kind of points or thoughts or bits of clarification people want to know. Yeah. Hi, I'm a GP um, in the Western Suburbs. Um, 
I have an interest in the effect um, of the rugby industry and alcohol, and that's yeah. why things are quite skewed here, because it's a very powerful lobby in mm. the yeah. government. Do you have that issue in Scotland? Like we do, um, and I think uh, my very first involvement in any policy thing was when um, the two big Glasgow football teams, Rangers and Celtic, were sponsored, first sponsored by a beer company in 2001. And uh, I'm a Celtic supporter, my kids are a Celtic supporter, and if I went to buy a top for my son, who's nine or ten at that time, he'd have been running around with a beer logo mm -hmm. on it. So Celtic playing green or white hoops, as some of you might know, and I ended up buying him a, a sporting Lisbon strip, which also has green or white hoops. Uh, so that was the closest I would, I would do was to buy him a, a strip from another team that looked a bit like a Celtic strip. But in fact, we were ultimately successful with that campaign to get the logos off children's size strips. We had some fascinating arguments. One of the arguments against that from the industry, because the clubs actually were reasonably supportive of this industry were against it, is that if we took the um, drinks logos off kids size strips, it would be bad for family harmony. So your, <laughs> your, son, your son would open his strip on a Christmas morning and say, Dad, this doesn't look like the real one. You're a bad father. And stuff. So it's a ridiculous argument, but that that was so. But eventually, again, they decided that it was the kid size thing was just getting too bad for them. They did it voluntarily after a couple of years of pressure. So that was our starting point on sport on sport sponsorship. But uh, I, I might as well jump ahead to, to um, a, a slide that I've got towards the end, which shows very high levels of beer brand awareness amongst kids and almost all of that is through sports promotion. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a team in, in, in Durham University who analysed exposure to alcohol ads at sports mm -hmm. broadcasting and it's not the adverts in the middle of the programme. 90% of the exposure was billboards around the ground and logos on the shirts. So I think we've kind of started to, 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 we were a bit tentative I think about the adults stuff on that, but I've been surprised just over the past couple of months that I think there's a bit of a head of steam building in, um, uh, at home on that. And Gary Lineker, who's a prominent English footballer who's now a host of our TV uh, programme, surprised me a little bit by going public that he, he thinks it's completely inappropriate there's alcohol sponsorship in, in football. He says the same about gambling. Uh, our First Minister, Alex Salmon, somewhat to my surprise, said, said, said the same. So I think that uh, it's, it's worth pursuing because I think it's increasingly obvious that that's a very, very important thing of building brand awareness. Yeah, in New Zealand, you know, 2009, the Law Commission report came out. Yeah. And then we had the Rugby World Cup in 2011. And I think that's the main reason that most of the things were taken up mm. because it just was you know, not good for the industry, the rugby yeah. industry. With yeah. the economy, etc., etc. Yeah. So yeah. it's delayed things quite a lot. Yeah. We're up against powerful forces here. Yeah. Uh, the FIFA World Cup in Brazil, uh, Brazil and Russia, the next World Cups in Russia, uh, neither of those countries allow alcohol sales in the stadium. And FIFA insisted that the country change the law mm -hmm. if they're going to host the World Cup. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's what's called the FIFA law. And um, <laughs> there, there, there are quotes from the Secretary General of FIFA, a guy called Jerome Valky, that says the Brazilian government will just have to do what we want mm. or the World Cup's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're really we're going to kind of push that. Mm. Uh, Vladimir Putin has just backed down to FIFA and agreed that alcohol will be sold in Russian stadia at the, at the next World Cup. So, there, and that's uh, Budweiser in response to the, the, the World Cup. So, uh, I think it's definitely worth a go though and I think as with minimum unit pricing we've actually found there's much more public support out here, it, 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 much more public support at home for these measures than you might think. And did that Nigel Latta programme that, that was aired here a few weeks back I think made that point pretty well that mm. in the 80s actually people didn't want more liquor stores mm. in New Zealand, they didn't want the uh, stretch of our And I think our politicians have found that actually public support is much more with them on this than, than they might expect. Um, and that's obviously encouraged our politicians then to be brave. Um, so 
I think the sports sponsorship thing is definitely worth a go, but we probably need a, a integrated worldwide sort of thing on it. But uh, I think it's a sensible next step. Yeah. Any other points before I crack on to talk about about brief intervention? Yeah. I'm a doctor working in psychiatry at the moment, but I'm just interested in your experience around advocating for the kind of evidence that works versus what we hear a lot, which is about personal responsibility. Yeah. And we've heard that coming from top level in government all the way down, and yeah. unfortunately, this industry likes that. Yes. And we know it doesn't work. But yeah. we have an example locally where our new world is the only one in Wellington where you walk through alcohol mm. before you get to food. And New yeah. of course, has a really high rate of yeah. people who live in housing and who have issues around that. Yeah. And part is that, but yeah. of course, and yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, you're absolutely right about the personal responsibility thing. Um, and I think the answer to that is, is why is alcohol then licensed? Why is every country in the world deciding that we need to have regulation for this thing? So, uh, uh, you know, you've already decided as a government there's going to be regulation. Let's talk about what that regulation ought to be. The thing on the stores thing, we, we had, and I was really pleased that it worked out this way, uh, a bunch of our patients from my, my own clinical service at the time uh, made a submission to the consultation. And what they said was, uh, in terms of alcohol being displayed to the store, that if they've kind of been recovering, trying to quit drinking, and they find alcohol then spread through the, through the shop, it's not helped them. So there's this guy who was good at presenting these things. So he, he had this story, I'm not sure it was true, but it was a good story. That he, he, he went to buy a lemon for his wife, to make lemon cake and there was a bottle of gin sitting beside the lemon and tonic to make yourself a gin and tonic with the lemon. And that, he, so he told that story actually to the parliamentary committee and, and on the back of that and other stories, the decision was made that alcohol in Scotland needs to be in a separate part of the store. Um, so actually our patient voice can be pretty powerful in the middle of this. Uh, not every patient's going to want to be involved in that stuff, but actually they can do things and say things that, that we can't. So um, that actually, once we got publicity around that issue um, of how alcohol is displayed in stores, very quickly, the kind of public and political leaders, yeah, this is right. But uh, you know, alcohol is not an ordinary commodity; it needs to be separate. So um, that, but the patient's voice is pretty important in that in that particular debate for us. Yeah. Um, I'm the sector health physician here, so I have yes. an interest in yes. um, I just want to comment on what kind of values, but is it okay what I say to people is that responsible drinking is an oxymoron? Yeah. So I'm talking about feeding someone a substance that significantly knocks off the part of the brain that takes responsibility. Yeah. And then tell them to be yes. responsible. I'm yes. sorry, but I just get, I yes. get time I hear the phrase, I just want to jump up and down and say yes. it's an oxymoron. Am I right? Or am I no, I, I never use it. You know, I, I think it's it's uh, it's not a useful phrase. It's um, it's obviously been kind of carefully crafted by the industry. Um, and in fact, I, I, on the flight over, I watched the Simpsons movie, which I'd never seen before, but you know, uh, it was really good. And, and this, I mean, the Simpsons pastiches of Duff Beer are terrific. And they, they had you know, so I don't know if anybody remembers the Simpsons movie that. Uh, that they're at this kind of music festival sponsored by Duff Beer, and it's got this thing, Duff Beer bins responsibly. <laughs> so, um, so, um, it, so exactly, I, I think we have, I think, had to be careful. Not, I, I don't think there was any value, it would be bogus for us to have said we're temperance campaigners. I drink myself, I enjoy alcohol. I'm quite happy to admit that. So, uh, uh, that's the truth of it. Um, and um, we don't have any abstainers, I don't think, in our, in our advocacy group. Um, plus, politically, that, although, as I say, I, I, I do think the temperance movement's had a bad rap and they did an awful lot of good things, and, and we should maybe try and rewrite the way that history's come to be written about that. But that's probably a bit of a stretch. There wasn't going to be any value in us being seen as prohibitionists. Um, and, uh, but I, but I agree with you that we shouldn't use that, that responsibility language as a, as a cul-de-sac and we shouldn't get 
proven to that. Okay, just then to kind of move on because, you know, pricing is very, very important. Sorry, one point at the back there. You're still on, the, um, on your screen about the density. Um, we, we find that um, the off licences always try and go to areas of our communities that have um, high outlets anyway. And we have to fight those individually. And there are ways that can be got around that people don't advertise in the most obvious ways that they want to open an off licence. Yeah. And so we have a short time frame where we have to get in and write some mission yeah. to, you know, fight it. Um, but you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, that um, there's only a mid-range effect on the density of having off licenses? Yeah, it's, it's mid-range, but it's very well worth doing. You know, so it's not kind of right up there with price, but it's, you know, it's, it's so, um, you know, it's a very worthwhile thing to do. Our problem in Scotland with that, I think it's probably the same as yours, that you'll have a local authority, of licensing authority of some sort, and in Scotland those might cover pretty small populations of 80 odd thousand, up against Walmart, who mm -hmm. has that. So guess who's got the best lawyers? And that's the problem. And uh, so I think that so while local solutions for local licensing situations sounds fine, that kind of means for these small councils you're on your own. And I, I think the only solution to that is a strong national framework of, you know, this is a reasonable number of off licenses per 10,000 population for the whole of New Zealand. And you can tweak that a wee bit depending on local circumstances. City centres, entertainment districts might get higher compared to whatever. But, but, I, but, I, but I think that's that's really going to be the, the, the solution to it. Is there any international information about what the best was best to do? Well I think different licensing the the Alcohol Focus Scotland if you Google it have just produced a, a report on, on on the challenges in licensing which probably will do no more than tell you that they're facing the same problems as as you are. Um, and in fact the the interesting thing about this, and it may be a complete non-starter in New Zealand, and it may be a complete non-starter in Scotland, is that the state monopolies for alcohol have much to commend them. You know, the countries that have had state monopolies, and we're not just talking about high control Nordic states, about a third of the states in, in, in the United States of America have state licensing you know, liquor outlets. They make an absolute fortune for public funds. And they all the placing of outlets, the pricing, and all that stuff is is um, is, is is done, you know, kind of democratic under democratic control. Um, the the uh, one of my family members is, is a craft brewer, uh, and he's now working out in Norway. He's worked in New Zealand, he's worked uh, in, in the UK. And he loves working in Norway because getting his product into the shops, to the state monopoly in Norway as a small producer, is much easier than dealing with the big supermarkets in Britain. So the notion that state monopoly restricts consumer choice in the ground, I just don't think it stands up. So who knows with our vote next Thursday we you know, might get to talk about this in Scotland. So it's a bit of a long shot and you know you might give a go in New Zealand, I wouldn't predict to get anywhere. But but I think it's worth reminding licensing authorities that there are lots of places in the world where it's decided that the free market isn't the right way to, to handle you know, alcohol outlets, because uh, that's the kind of battle that, that you're in really. So I think you'll find that lots of places are facing the same challenge as you, the places that are successful are the ones that really have had quite con tight controls on, on retail. <coughs> okay, um, just to move on to talk a, a little bit about, about other things that we're, that we're doing. Um, this is a report that we produced on screening and, and brief interventions, which is uh, I'll just talk you through the, the timeline for that. This Royal College's guideline produced in 2003, reviewing the evidence which had been building for 20 years at that time, but contrary to what some of us might think, and a little bit like smoking cessation, a, a word of advice can go a long way, and if you do that, 
systematically enough, you know, you can make quite a big cumulative impact. So we're all pretty pleased when that report came out. We then had what I called the hearts and minds phase of going to particularly general practice, because primary care is the best setting for this, uh, saying, well, hey, you know, we've got a guideline, how about starting to do it? Um, we had strong links with our local GPs. We've been, I've been working there for a long time. I knew pretty much all of them. I remember going to some who I thought would be my ally and said, you know, hey, you know, how about start from screen brief intervention in, in your practice? And he said, look at the cover of your report. And I said, yeah, Scottish Intermediate Guideline. He said, what does it say after that? And I said, number 74. And he said, well, there are the other 73 mm -hmm. sitting you know, on the shelf there. And the truth was I was just the latest guy after the diabetes people and the hypertension people and whoever else, the police fracture people, you know, giving advice to primary care and what they should do. So um, there really was no implementation of that report until, again, you know, we had a bit of political will to do it. Um, we upped the tension, we went to the conference, and within a couple of months of that, we had a national health improvement target was set. Money came in for coordinator posts, uh, funding for for uh, brief interventions, and for care and treatment. Um, so, and that, together with what came in the following year of, of performance monitoring by the government of this, you know, really were the things that, that made a difference. So, hearts and minds really didn't work. A bit of carrot in terms of money and then a bit of stick in terms of, you know, health authorities being held to account by the health minister on whether they were hitting the target were the things that really made the difference. So, Brief interventions became one of our health improvement targets. So it wasn't a mental health target. It wasn't a substance misuse target. It was in there with obesity, dental care. You know, you can see the rest of the list there. So that was how it was presented in a whole population kind of way. Um, and it became, as I say, one of those health improvement targets. So a top-down, um, you know, way of, of, of approaching it and thinking about it. Um, and a couple of things to, to out of this. We decided, and I supported this somewhat, we got a bit of flack from my psychiatrist colleagues on this, that actually this was more important than care and treatment of alcohol dependence. So the brief intervention program had the first call on new funding. So you might have had people who have seen very pressing needs, health and homelessness services, you know, look at these people who are, you know, pretty likely to die in the next five years unless they get, you know, better treatment and access to residential rehab, blah, blah, blah. And so the tough call had to be made you know, that's a small number, this can benefit a big number, this is the priority. So, you know, we needed to be clear about that. And these were the three settings that we settled on where the evidence base led us to, uh, you know, having a, a, a to, to be worth focusing on primary care, uh, emergency departments and antenatal. And that was really based from the evidence review. So some settings that wanted to be in there, like pharmacies, the evidence wasn't there. Social care settings, Housing departments, evidence wasn't there. Um, police keen to do this, evidence wasn't there to do it. So we really needed to stick pretty closely to, to the evidence base. Let's talk through each of those settings in turn. Any any emergency doctors in the met three emergency doctors at uh, Wellington, uh, so, which I thought was great that they were interested in this. The kind of politicians thought that acts in emergency was, would, would be perfect. You know, lots of drunk people coming in, teachable moment, you know, and, and, and that, that, would be, that would be ideal. You know, none of us who spent much time either, you know, working with emergency departments thought that, would, that was going to work. So, you know, really because of all these reasons, uh, including emergency departments, becoming very sensitive about getting dumped with what they saw as primary care work. We are not a place for screening. Uh, we are a place for dealing with emergencies. So there, there was a bit of reluctance from for, for that. And so probably what we ended up doing most of in primary care was looking for other bits. So a call back to the fracture clinic, places that had short stay wards where you could deliver the brief intervention the following morning. 
people having to go back to primary care to get the sutures taken out. You know, those were the kind of teachable models that we, we ended up using in, in, in primary care. Antenatal the numbers really were pretty small. Uh, the vast majority of people of women reported abstinence. You know, as, as by the time they, they were booking in. Um, and the, the, the only ones who, who really were not reporting abstinence were, were in pretty considerable trouble. You know, alcohol dependent. We've got a big methadone program in Scotland and, and many of them drink heavily. And, and so the specialist services dealing with, 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 with that group of women becoming pregnant have high rates of, of alcohol and so on and so forth. Um, but it, it really didn't turn out to be a particularly happy, happy hunting ground, even though there'd been a couple of, to be honest, pretty smallish trials that, that we, we, we faced and we put them in. Um, one important issue, and I think it'll probably be pretty obvious to this group, is, is um, if you're trying to mount a response to fetal alcohol syndrome, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, in which loads of the science of that, I think, remains to be unpacked and unfolded, I think, particularly at the fetal alcohol spectrum disorder definitions, there's a lot of stuff included in there that I think is running a bit ahead of the neuroscience, to be honest with you, but uh, that's a personal view. Um, but I think one thing most people agree on is that in the very early stages of conception are a risk period, and of course many women don't know that they're pregnant at that time, and I think the only way to reduce alcohol exposure at that level is a whole population of coaching women of drinking age, so sticking up picture of a pregnant woman and a beer bottle with a line through it is far from being enough to deal with this. So, um, you know, if we're thinking about population terms. Um, but primary care, I think, was, was the big prize and the one that we spent most time focusing on. Um, and primary care, we're convinced by the evidence base, which is pretty strong and it's been, you know, increasingly generated over the last 20 years. Time demands were seen as being a bit of an issue, particularly if, you know, people are coming in with a list of five things they want dealt with in their 20 minute consultation. Um, but I think in, in UK settings, primary care is free, people don't pay. Um, consultation time is about 20 minutes and actually, you know, GPs are quite used to doing quite complex things in those 20 minutes. So actually we found that once the programme was up and running, uh, it proved quite popular with Staff felt that it was doable, uh, and patients were patients were not surprised that they were being asked about their alcohol. You know, they, they, they weren't storming out of surgeries and so on. Um, it needed to have carrots in exactly the same way as if the government decides they want to run a vaccination program, then primary care gets funded to do that, and they needed to get funded to do brief interventions in exactly the same kind of way. So that that, that was you know the way of getting it done. And there are various specialist primary care settings, like sexual health, um, uh, you know, as an example, which has proved to be a, a pretty good, a pretty good setting. So I won't say too much about uh, about uh, the, the mechanism of, of doing that. Uh, if anybody was interested, I'd, I'd be happy to send them some materials. And I think this is just to tell you that the programme we were kind of aiming for about sixty thousand a year, and it's outperformed much to our pleasant surprise. Um, and so a population of 5.3 million in Scotland, we're delivering about 100,000 brief interventions a year. Uh, and the uh, vast majority of them, 69% in primary care, smaller number in A&E, smallish number in anti and We've kind of loosened up a wee bit on the, on the sticking to the evidence base and we've allowed uh, district health authorities to include about 10% of wider settings, which might be things like community pharmacy and, and criminal justice settings. I was, I was talking about earlier. But primary care, you know, remains the real prize. But I think our message on screening brief intervention uh, has been that it's it needed the top-down thing to really make it happen. You could build some bottom-up commitment to that, of course. But you needed to have the performance management lever, you know, thrown into action. So, um, fairly quickly, these are the, the principles of brief intervention, and there are a lot of good training materials developed by NHS Health Scotland. If you Googled NHS Health Scotland alcohol, you get to all this pretty quickly. 
Um, so delivered within the consultation, so not please come back and have a word with the practice nurse about your drinking. Deliver it right in the consultation there and then try and keep it you know, relevant to the presenting complaint. These kind of motivation interviewing principles, health behaviour change, just trying to get the patient built, you know, thinking about this, you don't necessarily want them to be signing a pledge of never to drink again by the time you leave your surgery, but as long as they're going to be thinking about it. It does seem to be that if it's delivered in some kind of ongoing relationship with primary care is ideal for that, but you know, it, um, you know, the, the effect's going to be greater than the kind of one health thing that you might get in the emergency department. So those seem to be the principles of, of, of things being delivered. Um, time's marching on. I won't say too much about specialist <coughs> treatment uh, of alcohol disorders, except to say that there's a nice guideline. They were even worse than us. Number 115, this is. <laughs> for, uh, for a nice guideline. But a good evidence review. Um, the bit I'll go to quickly with this is that every time I work with health economists, it cheers me up. Because any intervention for alcohol is just so cost effective. Because if you don't do anything, it costs an absolute fortune. Mm -hmm. So um, a, a negative, th this figure actually is, is, is the, net, the amount of money that, that is saved. So in other words, the, m the money you save more than covers the cost of the intervention, even in specialist treatment. So even though the outcomes are maybe as great as we would like them to be, they're good enough to, to be very much better than doing nothing and they, call, they save huge amounts of money. Of course the problem for any managers here is the department that saves the money isn't the one that gets the money back and all that kind of stuff. But uh, it, it's well worth doing and alcohol inter interventions both at an individual and population level stack up really well in, 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 in health economy terms. So our treatments are reasonably effective. There are a range of outcomes and quite often the outcome of specialist treatment uh, is not abstinence. Neither is it completely controlled drinking, it's kind of somewhere in between, but that's well worth doing. The state care approach makes sense, sometimes highly dependent people do very well with very little intervention and that's nice when it happens. In the UK there's a huge treatment gap and we probably have about 10% of the treatment facilities in, in both community and residential treatment that we, that, that we need. Um, so, but I, as I say, I'll, I won't say too, too, much, too much more about that. Um, Moving on, and this was the thing that you were getting to, this was the, the Welsh study I was talking about. 10 and 11 year olds, brand recognition, 80% of them knew the Lager brand. The quarters of them knew this ice cream brand, which I understand is, is, is not so. Ben & Jerry's ice cream, like the US uh, ice cream brand that's now sold in the UK. Most of the Kipling's cakes have since learned you don't have them either, which is confectionery. But well, you might not be thrilled that kids are swapped with ads for confection ice cream, at least it's age appropriate. Uh, and but their awareness of, of, of Carlsberg Lager was even higher. And amongst boys, their awareness of Magnus Cider, who's, who sponsored rugby league in South, uh, sorry, rugby, the rugby union league in South Wales, was pretty much 100%. So all those rugby mad boys in South Wales knew this cider brand. Magnus also sponsors uh, Celtic. Uh, my football club, and so any young Celtic fan will, even though they can't buy a strip with the logo on it, will be seeing it you know, every day. Uh, and I, as I was saying, I, I do think this is a, a line that's kind of worth pursuing for us. A colleague who, who actually has been out in New Zealand, I've forgotten that, Jared Hastings, who's a marketing um, research in the University of Stirling, um, did some, some, some great work. He had access to, to some background papers from the alcohol industry. Um, and the way they think about advertising. So young men think about four things. Beer, football, this is a big music festival, and this is a proxy for sex. So those are the four <laughs> things that young men think about. Um, that's a, a baby in a beer sponsored football club. So beer, football, music and sex. The beer company says, we brew one and sponsor two of them. Okay. And that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to get right into the heart of what keeps young men together, football and music. And for women, and I should probably include this slide, the adverts are much more kind of transformative. Um, the the, the uh, sparkling wine ad that they had for women was uh, Lambrini, it's actually not a wine, it's a cider, but that's not a story. 
Lambrini will transform you from everyday working girl into the glamour puss within, that lies within you. Okay. And that, so that is women's advertising, is this transformative thing. So they sponsored makeover shows, you know, turning a you know, normal looking girl into, you know, made up uh, dress, you know, luxury clothes kind of stuff. So for women, for men it was bonding, for women it was transformation. Actually one of the really striking things from Gerard's work is, is the gendered approach to advertising. So completely different thinking for men than for, for women. Uh, and so that report was called They'll Drink Bucket Loads of the Stuff, uh, which again was a phrase that Gerard found. So if you're interested in chasing up that, that's a bit of a repository. But it was a one-off lucky break. House of Commons was doing an inquiry it meant that this information could be, you know, requisitioned and found out else we'd never have got to it. But it really gave us, I think, some, some, some really kind of, you know, valuable insights. So, just finishing off, this is the WHO list of alcohol best buys, and that maps very closely to the Law Commission report, it maps very closely to Alcohol Action New Zealand. And it maps very closely to what we've done. So there's really an international consensus on this list now. And I won't run through all of this, but we've done little bits and pieces on, on all of those things. And of course, there's a huge synergistic effect that if you do all of them together, you, 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 um, you know, you, 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 you'll make some headway. Just on the, the over-provision and, and licensing, we do have a public health principle built in to the Scottish <coughs> Licensing Act, which was passed in 2005, that says that public health is one of the things that licensing authorities need to think about. So we're pretty pleased about that, but as I was saying earlier, actually getting them to act on that has, has proved difficult simply because they get frightened about the legal challenges and all that kind of stuff. So that's, that's um, really you know, where, where we, we've got to. So back to our take home message, which is that we've seen this very welcome fall in alcohol related admissions to Scottish hospitals, which is a climb similar to the mortality rates. And this is how alcohol affordability tracks. So the two track each other very closely. We've seen a fall in affordability since the recession, incomes have fallen, inflation's gone up, so affordability's come down. And much as I would like to think that you know, we've been dead clever and all these other things. I, I do think it's reasonable to think brief interventions have had a bit of an effect. I think it's really been this kind of chance fall in affordability that's, that's, that's helped us out. Um, so uh, these are our take-home messages that things change. Um, and, and they've been changing very much for the worse in the UK. You need good data to be able to prove that, and that's worth investing in. The politics of any. The doctors are a very important advocacy group here. The politicians knew they would face opposition in doing this and they needed to know that they had strong supporters. You might not always feel powerful as a doctor in your day-to-day -day work, but in public discourse we are powerful. Ourselves, the police, groups like that getting out there saying, you know, people are dying in my hospital, you know, every second murder I see is a policeman is related to, to, to other. These are powerful messages and hard ones for the drinks industry to challenge. So we need to be out there carrying this message because we've got a certain amount of armour because of the nature of our profession and the way people think about it. And so we need to be brave about that. Um, and uh, it's uh, worth having a go. So I'll finish off there. Uh, I'm happy to take any more points. Yeah.